Welcome to episode 21 of the Cycling Europe podcast. My name is Andrew P. Sykes. This episode of the podcast is going to be slightly different. Rather than talking to a current cyclist, I'm going to be investigating the life of a cyclist from the past. You've probably never heard his name before, and you're even less likely to have heard his story. He was a German-born American called Maximilian John St. George. He's usually referred to as Maximilian J. St. George. I'm just going to call him Maximilian, perhaps even Max. Max's cycling story starts at the beginning of the 20th century. My knowledge of him, however, is much more recent and started when, in May 2013, I received an email from a chap called Angelo in America. Angelo explained how he had received a copy of my first book, Crossing Europe, about my cycle from southern England to southern Italy for his 66th birthday and had thoroughly enjoyed reading it. He went on to explain that he had always wanted to complete a long cycling tour of Europe and cited a book published in 1922 called Travelling Light or Cycling Europe on 50 Cents a Day. My attention was immediately drawn to the use of the expression Cycling Europe. By that point, I had become Mr Cycling Europe on social media and on my website cyclingeurope.org. It seemed almost anachronistic that the same expression should be used within the title of a book from the 1920s. Angelo continued as follows, and here I'm quoting directly from his words in that original email. The author Maximilian J. St. George was a young American, recently graduated from law school at Notre Dame in Indiana. Before embarking on his career, he went off on a 16-month cycling tour of Europe. This was around 1920. Total mileage was 16,300 miles. The condition he placed upon himself was that he would not stay in any hotels, rather he would ask locals if he could stay in a barn or some form of shelter. He wanted to meet the people of Europe face to face. Often he was invited to stay in their home. He passed through every European capital except Lisbon and Petrograd. End quote. Petrograd is the city that we now call St Petersburg. Angelo went on to say that he would love to follow Max's general route through Europe, but finishing Conversano in southern Italy, the place from where his own parents had emigrated to America. I've tried to contact Angelo for an update, but haven't heard anything back from him, so I'm not sure if he ever did set off in the tyre tracks of Max or not. If you're listening to this, Angelo, I'd love to know. At the time, I posted the details about Maximilian J. St. George, his journey and his book, to my website. I did a little bit of research about Max, but could only find out that he had been born in 1885 and that later in life he'd become a successful attorney, making his name in the Great Sedition Trial of 1944. I looked online for a copy of his book, but no luck. I remember thinking that it would be nice come 2020, a hundred years after Angelo said he'd set off, to do something in Max's honour, perhaps even try and recreate his long journey across Europe. In the summer of 2013 I set off on a second long cycle, this time from southern Greece to southern Portugal, and subsequently wrote my second book, Along the Med. Then, in 2014, I decided that there was at least one more long European cycle in me, and I came up with the idea of cycling from the southernmost point of Europe at Tarifa in Spain to the northernmost point at Nordcap in Norway. I was working as a secondary school teacher at the time in Oxfordshire. The previous two European cycles had been squeezed into the long summer holidays. That wasn't going to be possible bearing in mind the length of the third proposed journey, which I estimated to be around 7,500 kilometres. I made the decision to leave my job in December 2014, move back up to Yorkshire, the area where I was born and brought up, and then head off down to Spain in the early spring of 2015. The book about that journey, Spain to Norway, was published in 2017, and in a few moments I'm going to be reading a short extract. The context of that extract is as follows. I was cycling along the west coast of Sweden, and I'd repeatedly met a German cyclist called Manfred, although in the book, to save his blushes, should he ever read it, I referred to him as Helmut. Manfred slash Helmut seemed to put a negative spin on everything, and each time we met over the course of perhaps a week, my heart sank a little further. Here's the extract. The words of Manfred are read by my good friend from Stuttgart, Klaus. Norway is too hilly. The roads are bad, 
And the weather is awful, he moaned before getting his teeth into the Swedes. They are poor cyclists. Their bikes only have three gears, and you will never find a bike shop to repair your bike properly. What had I done to have this man inflicted upon me? His oratory then took a surreal twist. Cycle touring only became possible after 1990, when the technology allowed for proper gears to be used. Did you say 1990-1990? I questioned, checking he hadn't confused his numbers. Yes, 1990-1990. I sensed he was annoyed at me questioning his facts. I was tempted to cite the case of an American, Maximilian J. St. George, who, in the years following the First World War, embarked upon a 26000 kilometer bicycle tour of Europe. He ventured to most parts of the continent, and upon his return to the US wrote a book entitled Travelling Light or Cycling Europe on 50 cents a day. I tried but failed to find a copy, but mentioned Maximilian, his adventure, and his book on my website, shortly before setting off to cycle from Greece to Portugal in 2013. Then, on the day I left my job as a teacher in Henley-on-Thames, my colleagues presented me with a package wrapped in tissue paper. Carefully unfolding the wrapping, I found a copy of the book. It was a touching moment. Indeed it was. One of my soon-to-be-former teaching colleagues had gone to the trouble of finding the book that Angelo had mentioned, but that I hadn't been able to find. Before setting off to cycle from Spain to Norway, I read the book, and it was an interesting read. Again, in the back of my mind, I thought how nice it would be to mark the centenary of Max's journey in 2020. Move on five years, and we're now in 2020, and in lockdown. So a few weeks ago, I picked up Travelling Light again and reread it, perhaps in more detail than I'd originally read it in early 2015. But there were two things that troubled me. Firstly, there was only one reference to the war. This was bizarre. In 1920, World War I, the war to end all wars, had only just finished. You'd think that it might have been something that any traveller through Europe would have remarked upon repeatedly, but he didn't. And when he did mention it, it wasn't by name, the Great War, it was just in an oblique comment about a conversation overheard in a train carriage. Here's the actor Jeremy Walker reading that short extract from Max's book. The next morning, I tried in vain to secure a pass to Bordeaux, so I bought a ticket to Angoulême. The train was packed with soldiers. The main topic of conversation was the possibility of another war with Germany, and of course, that country's certain annihilation. But one fat old Frenchman, clad in the long black blouse, so universal throughout the country, had grave doubts as to the latter point. The soldiers were indignant and would have nothing further to do with him. We'll hear more extracts read by Jeremy later in the podcast. The other thing that Max never mentions, this time not once, is the so-called Spanish flu. This infected a third of the world's population in 1918 and 1919 and killed many millions of people. So again, you'd think that a traveller through Europe in 1920 might have it playing on his mind. Not so Max, or if it was, he wasn't telling us. These two omissions were curious to say the very least. We know that the book was published in 1922 by Extension Press in Chicago and reprinted in 1923. It says so in the front of the book. But in the text itself, Maximilian never refers to the years in which he was travelling. It's an interesting observation that nowadays we're quite fixated with years. Many things are defined by the year in which they take place. London 2012, the Silver Jubilee of 1977, the general election of 2010 and, of course, the coronavirus pandemic of 2020. Most of the defining events of the 20th century that we frequently refer to even now the wars mainly, but also things like the 1966 World Cup final, if you're English, had yet to happen. Perhaps using years as place markers in time was a much less frequent trait in the first few years of last century compared to now. Max does refer to certain dates and months, so we know, for example, that he left his home in America on the 15th day of June. We also know that at the end of his trip, he caught the boat back to Boston on the 7th of September the following year, 
Angelo, in his email to me in 2013, had said Max's journey took place, quote, around 1920, end quote. Setting off on June 15th, 1920, if you're listening to this podcast on the day it's been published, that's 100 years ago today, returning home on September the 7th, 1921, writing a book and then having it published in 1922 seems about right. But it isn't. And the clue as to when the journey did actually take place is in the short introduction written by a certain John Kavanagh. It's a clue that's easy to skip over, and I did, twice. In the fifth of his six short paragraphs, he says the following. All this happened before the war. Could such an experience befall a pauper pilgrim now? International hatred and suspicion have changed much that was beautiful a decade ago, and it is to be feared that the slowest of reparations will be the restoration of that general international trust and charity manifested in this unpretentious recital of a pleasant pilgrimage among remote and unfamiliar peoples. Surely no one can read it without feeling how unreasonable and shameful, as well as unchristian, is hatred among nations. So there's the answer. Max never mentions the war or the Spanish flu because they hadn't yet taken place. He didn't cycle through Europe in 1920 and 1921, so when did he cycle? This is where I become detective. Kavanagh's introduction is dated November the 14th, 1922. He uses the expressions before the war and a decade ago, but they are rather vague. Any teacher worthy of their qualification knows that it's pointless telling a student that they have five minutes in which to do something, as five minutes never actually means five minutes. Similarly, a decade ago could be eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve years, perhaps even more. So we can't assume that Max set off in 1912, which is a good job, because he didn't. In the last few weeks, I've spent quite a few hours piecing together the life of Maximilian J. St. George and, crucially, that of his wife, Ape Lucia St. George. She was Italian, and that's important, but we'll come back to her in a few minutes. First Max. He was born in 1885 in an area of eastern Germany that is now in southwestern Poland. His original name was Maximilian Juraszek. In April 1892, he emigrated to the United States with his family, initially to Texas. His formal education culminated at the Catholic College of Notre Dame in Indiana in 1908. He's now 22 years old and, with his qualifications to practice law acquired, free to travel. That said, he's no novice traveller, as he explains at the very start of the book. I have always wanted to see Europe, said the editor of a Chicago daily paper. But the thought of the expanses held me back. It was this remark that inspired me to write an account of my experiences while cycling through Europe. By nature, I am of a roving disposition. Years ago, when I was a small lad, an old Negro woman, respected as the sibyl of her people, told my mother that I would be a wanderer, and my youthful venturings seemed to bear her out. As the years passed, the wanderlust grew. I didn't even go home for my yearly holidays. I spent my vacations traveling. By the time I'd completed my university course, I'd seen practically all of the United States, Canada, Newfoundland, Mexico, Central America, parts of South America, Cuba, and the West Indies. But as I've already pointed out, he doesn't tell us when he did set off cycling around Europe whether it was just after he graduated from college or a few years later. His wife, Ape Lucia, as we've mentioned, is Italian. Max actually met Ape when he was cycling in Europe, and he talks about this in the book. But there are two versions of this romantic coupling, one in the book and another in a rather gushing syndicated newspaper article from 1913 entitled How a Chicago wandering knight of the bike won an Italian fairy princess. We actually learn much more from the newspaper article in 1913 than we do from Max's book, written in the early 1920s. The newspaper article kicks off with a quote. 
You can't tell me that romance is dead, says Maximilian John St. George. And Maximilian knows what he's talking about. For he worked his way to Europe on a cattle boat, rode a bicycle 16,000 miles through strange lands on 40 cents a day, and won the heart of a rich and beautiful Italian noblewoman in her marble mansion on the Bay of Naples. 50 cents a day seems to have become 40 cents for the journalist, but that aside, we learn how Max pauses in Castellamare di Stabia to eat lunch and is surrounded by the curious locals, attracted by his foreign air. It's revealed that Max's future wife is, in fact, the daughter of a chevalier of the Italian crown, a certain Signor Quirico Manni. He told them of his wanderings, and they listened as Desdemona listened to Othello. Oh, I could love such a man, exclaimed Signorina Appe impulsively. It's explained in the article how last year Max went back to Italy to see Appe and that on August 4th they will be married. The whole piece is complemented with a grainy photo of Appe doing her best to channel Princess Leia's hairstyle decades before George Lucas imagined how it might be and a bespectacled Max looking rather suave in a dinner jacket, bow tie and turned up collar looking like an aristocratic extra from Downton Abbey. There's even a cartoon of a man dressed head to toe in a chequered tweed suit on a bike. It's all very entertaining and very different from the style of the book. But it crucially gives us another date in our investigation, August the 4th, 1913. This matches the records that show both of them returning to the United States by boat from Naples to New York on August 30th of that year. But it also means that both 1913 and 1912 are out of contention for the years of Max's journey, as it seems unlikely that in 1912, the year that Max returned to Italy to propose, he would have travelled all the way back to Europe within weeks of his cycling trip finishing in the September. So we've narrowed things down to 1911 or before. But which year is it to be? Well, there's a mention in the listings of the Chicago Tribune about Max wanting to change his name on the roll of attorneys. He tried first in October 1910, but the request was denied. He tried again in October 1911, and, well, we don't know officially, but we can assume that that attempt was successful, as we now know him as Mr St George rather than Mr Juracek. So by the autumn of 1910, he had his mind back on the law. Seems unlikely that he would be doing all this administrative changing of his name while cycling across Europe, so he can now discount 1911. That change of name got me thinking, and following a search that included his original name provided the key to the mystery. On December the 5th, 1935, the Kerrville Mountain Sun in Texas published an article about the history of a local church called St Mary's. The Jurashek family had connections with this church. Texas was, after all, the state to which the family had emigrated in 1892, and Max gets a passing mention when church renovations are being discussed. I quote, The tile and mason contract went to Theodore Jurashek, whose brother, Maximilian, graduated from Notre Dame University and then with $250 and a bicycle travelled all over Europe for 16 months, wheeling 16,300 miles. On April 7th, 1909, he visited Father Kemper in Rome and borrowed his black suit to attend a papal audience. End quote. So there we have it. He was in Rome in April 1909, meaning that he started his journey in 1908, immediately after graduating from college. So if you are listening to this podcast on the date it's been published, June 15th, 2020, we're not marking the 100th anniversary of the departure of Max from Chicago on his epic cycle tour of Europe, but the 112th anniversary. Nowadays, cycle touring is a popular way to spend your holidays. Every year, thousands of Americans travel to Europe with their bikes for a few weeks, perhaps even for a few months, of cycling. That wasn't the case back in 1908, and Max explains to us why he's chosen to cycle rather than use other methods of transport. Like most people, I wanted to see Europe. To see not only tourist Europe, but the real Europe as well. 
by rail I'd be whisked from one city to another and see nothing of the country between. Walking was too slow, in fact, out of the question because of the itinerary contemplated. An automobile was too expensive, a motorcycle too heavy, as well as unsatisfactory because of the speed at which one's tempted to ride. So there remained only the bicycle. On this, I determined to make the trip. In terms of his route, it was a tortuous one to say the very least. He does tell us that he spent months planning the trip, but I do wonder if he dedicated much of that time to the twists and turns of the actual route he ended up cycling. Arrived in London, I rode to Dover, where I crossed to the continent. With the exception of Lisbon and Petrograd, I saw every capital of Europe. In short, I cycled six times into Germany, four times into England, three times into Belgium, Holland, Austria, and France, through Denmark, Norway, Sweden, and Scotland, around Switzerland, Ireland, Spain, and Italy. The 16th month saw me again in London, after cycling 16,300 miles. That's just a hint of the complexity. Fortunately, at the end of the book in a four-page appendix, he lists every town and city through which he passed. I'll spare you all the detail, but basically, and this is about as basic as I can make it, he set off from London immediately in the direction of the continent, taking the boat from Dover to Ostend, and then, via Brussels and Amsterdam, cycled north towards Scandinavia, visiting his next three capitals, Copenhagen, Oslo, although at the time it was known as Christiania, and Stockholm. Another boat brought him back to Germany, where he ticked off Berlin. The area to the southeast of Berlin, as mentioned earlier, is where he was born and brought up, and he revisits it twice. On this first occasion, it leads him eventually to Prague and then Vienna, before continuing west to Bern in Switzerland, via southern Germany and Geneva. He now follows the Rhine north, as far as Cologne, before passing through Luxembourg and then, for the first time, into France and Paris. He's now heading south, and via Bordeaux, crosses into Spain on the Atlantic coast before continuing to Madrid. At this point, he doesn't cycle to Lisbon, the capital of Portugal, which makes me wonder if it was ever his intention to pass through all the capitals in the first place, or whether it was something that he just happened to do inadvertently. So instead of Lisbon, he heads for the south coast and Cadiz. His journey now becomes very coastal, and he travels via Valencia to Barcelona, back into France, Marseille, Nice, and then into Italy to Rome, and south to Naples where, as we know, he meets his future wife. He now starts cycling north, but on the Adriatic coast of Italy via Venice and Trieste, into what is now Slovenia and its capital Ljubljana, before Budapest and back towards his homeland in southern Poland. Continuing through the middle of Germany, he revisits Cologne and Brussels before catching a boat back to England via Calais. And he's not done yet. He has the capitals of the British Isles to visit, or most of them. After travelling along the south coast, through the Cotswolds and the English Midlands, he takes another boat from Holyhead on the Welsh island of Anglesey to Dublin before embarking upon a coastal cycle around the entire island of Ireland via Belfast, returning to Dublin for a boat to Liverpool. Travelling north, he cycles to Glasgow and takes a very scenic route to Edinburgh via Loch Lomond. The final leg of his 16,300-mile journey is through northern England via York and then Cambridge back to Tilbury Docks and his ship home to America. That's a European cycle tour to beat most others. At this point, I think it would be useful to find out a little bit more about life in Europe in the period immediately before the First World War. When Max left America in June 1908, Theodore Roosevelt was the president. In Britain, Edward VII was on the throne and Herbert Asquith had just become the prime minister. Looking at a map of Europe from 1910, the political geography of the continent was very different from what it is today. A few days ago, I spoke to Dr James Stout, Professor of World History at San Diego Mesa College in the United States. He also happens to be a former professional cyclist. I began by asking James to describe the wider political landscape of Europe in 1908. 
so what you're looking at is the end of these major European land empires, right? So you still have the Austro-Hungarian Empire, you've got this massive Russian Empire, right? It's sort of undifferentiated and comes all the way west to meet with like a Germany that, that moves much further east than we're, we're familiar with today. And traveling would have been very different then compared to a few years later. Things were already beginning to happen in the Balkans. Nationalism was beginning to lead to these national independence movements, but he wouldn't have needed stuff like a passport until after World War I. So even though you have these big empires who are at odds with each other, he could move between them, especially as a, a, just a cyclist, quite easily. We have to remember that like, nationalism isn't a thing that has always existed, right? Nationalism comes along with the printing press and the sort of fall of the claim of religion to have a monopoly on universal truth. Nationalism is beginning to exist in these areas in the Austro-Hungarian Empire and elsewhere where it didn't before, these political nationalisms, right? And I think if, if he was, uh, if he had his, his ears open and his eyes open to that, he would have noticed that. There's only one country that Max identifies as a place where he might have problems, and that's Spain. I asked James why people might have warned him against travelling through that particular country. What you're dealing with there is the black legend. It's this idea that Africa begins at the Pyrenees. That's very prevalent. France and Germany and Italy, these are places that have these great classical civilizations and these contributions to culture. And, and then they're also part of this modern European economy, which gives you a transnational bourgeoisie. It's Spain, outside of Catalonia, hadn't industrialized. And so it wasn't part of that. So it didn't have these economic or cultural ties to the rest of Europe. And as a result, it's seen very pejoratively in this period. And that takes a long time to change, actually. Like that doesn't change really until people like us start going to, to Spain for sort of cheap beer and beach holidays. I pointed out to James that Max claims to have visited all the European capitals apart from Petrograd and Lisbon and that he seems to consider everything south of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, basically south of the Danube, as no longer Europe. In 1908, Bulgaria has declared independence, uh, Austria-Hungary is annexing Bosnia and Herzegovina. So if he's reading the newspaper, it might simply be that he thinks that that's not the safest place to be riding his bike. But obviously this uh, sort of are the Ottomans European question, it's one of religion, it's one of race, ethnicity, right? Like it's one we're still grappling with, actually. I think this, uh, once you get to places where, you, where you're seeing a majority Muslim population, right, which is the area he seems to stop, this might be part of his concept of, of like a, a Christian or Catholic Europe from Bulgaria, let's say, or from the Ottoman Empire is it, the quote unquote Orient. And if you, if you buy this sort of colonial construction of the Orient, then once you're there, you may as well be in Iran or it's not culturally Europe. Would Max have travelled with a passport as we know them today? We didn't really start sort of requiring these travel documents in Europe until after the First World War, until we had to be worried about someone having nefarious reasons for travelling. But the US at that time was issuing passports in sort of a very... Uh, like American willy-nilly way. Like, uh, you might have one from the State Department, but you might have one from uh, like a notary public, or you might have one from the state in which you lived, uh, or from the governor of that state. So there, there were multiple entities issuing passports. Now, he will probably have had some kind of travel documentation. I think he'd have been, he'd have encountered more trouble if he didn't. And, but that probably would have been a combination of whatever passport he had and sort of, yeah, these, these letters, I would imagine he would maybe have visited consulates and such things and got sort of letters and, and got advice, right? This is a pre-internet era. And finally, I asked James how, as an American, Max would have been perceived by the Europeans of 1908 and 1909. Certainly, I think he would have been seen as a curiosity, yeah. A large number of working people in lots of parts of Europe will have had family who have done what he did, right, leave. So, you know, you, we have these German or Italian or Irish groups in the United States, right, who have come relatively recently and have still have very strong cultural ties to 
their homeland, that they will speak the languages like he did, right? Like it's not uh, assimilation to Americanness is not a rapid thing in the early 20th century. So people will have asked him, I'm sure people will have been interested. Chicago is very German at that time, right? They're, they're actually printing newspapers in German in Chicago. So certainly when he's, he's with these sort of German speaking people, like many of them will know someone who has gone where he's gone, right? Even like the beer, they, 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 that sort of whole area is associated with brewing still today, right? Because of the Germanic migration there. But I don't think he'd have been seen per se, with, especially as a first generation American. So I, I don't think he'd have been seen with that much suspicion. As John Kavanagh pointed out in his introduction to Max's book, that would probably have been different in many parts of Europe had he decided to wait until 1920 to set off cycling. Thanks to James Stout for providing some historical perspective. What about his kit? And the trip must have cost him a fortune, I hear you cry. Well, the clue is in the title of his book, Travelling Light or Cycling Europe on 50 Cents a Day. We'll focus on the money side of things to start with. Here's Max again. How did I manage it on such a small amount of money? In a word, I lived with the people. What I was doing, the trip I was making, was to the Europeans something above the ordinary. It appealed to them. Besides, I was an American. I came from the land of promise, the land of opportunities, the land to which they all longed to go. Being able to speak the different languages of Europe, I could tell them of many interesting things I'd seen. Especially could I answer their questions about America. Hardly ever did I stop at a house in Scandinavia, Ireland or Italy, but that I was told of some member of the family or a friend who had gone to America. On applying at a farm, I would at first merely ask permission to sleep on the straw in the barn. Sometimes this was given at once, again only after some hesitation. Occasionally my request met with refusal. I would then call it the next farmhouse. Once having the required consent, I would set about cleaning my machine. During this operation, I would answer a host of questions about my trip. Then if no one invited me into the house, I would ask to enter and write the day's happenings in my diary. This request was invariably granted, with two exceptions. My writing always excited their curiosity. And when they learned that I was a graduate of Notre Dame University and an attorney at law, they considered my visit an honor and would ask me to partake of supper with them. And eight times out of ten, a bed for the night was offered me with a cordial invitation to breakfast the following morning. Those of the more travel class received me well. Very often they urged me to remain a day or two. Priests and ministers were especially hospitable. Naturally, such men were able and willing to give me information about the people. So it helps to have friends in high places. His devout Catholicism seems to have been to his benefit, certainly financially, and it went down very well with the vicars of Europe. Max was discovering couch surfing about a hundred years before it had been invented. We'll return to the subject of money in a few moments. As for his kit... He was the bike packer of his day. My equipment was as light as possible. For one pound, more or less makes a great difference in a long trip. All my impedimenta was carried in a canvas knapsack, 18 inches long, 8 inches deep and 2 inches wide, strapped to the handlebars of the bicycle. Behind me on a carrier, I had a blanket to sleep on and a small rubberized cape bought in London as a protection against rain. In the knapsack were a pair of light trousers, some handkerchiefs, several pairs of socks, a small folding mirror and a comb, a razor, a shaving stick and a strop, notebooks, lead pencil, repair cement, a roll of rubber and a few pieces of outer tire. I wore a strong suit of clothes and shoes, a weatherproof cap, a celluloid collar, a light blue shirt, and lightweight underclothing. This was all I had. It may seem too little, especially on a trip of 16 months, and yet it proved adequate for all occasions. It is more practical and much easier to replace a worn article of wearing apparel by buying a new one than to carry extra luggage for months 
A little water and soap will make a celluloid collar look like new. And when other laundry work became necessary, I did it in the evening before retiring and started out the following morning with a clean supply. While riding during the day, I never wore my coat. By folding, wrapping, and tying it to the handlebars, it was kept clean. And on arriving at a city or town where I meant to remain for some time, my coat and the extra trousers came into service. Thus, with light luggage and a lighter heart, I toured Europe. Go on, admit it. Who hasn't gone cycling without a celluloid collar? There's a picture of him in the book with his packed bike, and his setup is rather reminiscent of a modern-day bike packer, with his luggage fixed high on the bike over his rear wheel, in his frame and on his handlebars. When it comes to his bicycle, however, whereas a modern-day blogger or travel writer might mention it quite frequently, I know I certainly do when I'm writing about my own experiences on two wheels and Reggie, my now-retired bicycle, even gets mentioned in the titles of the books, for goodness sake. But we learn very little about Max's bike. We have the photograph that I've just mentioned of him with his... Well, it's not the bike he brought with him from America. It's his second bike. He doesn't mention his first bike much at all until he arrives in Poitiers in France. And true to form, we don't know exactly when that was. He subsequently leaves Bordeaux on Christmas Eve after spending a short period of time working in the city. So I'm guessing that he passed through Poitiers at some point in November-ish of 1908. The reason why he finally talks about the bike is because he's having a few issues. As the pedals of my bicycle have been a little out of plumb for some time, I went to a bicycle mechanic in Poitiers to locate the trouble. I had to take out the pedals for him as he didn't know how. The right one proved to be broken in the hub. In order to remove the sleeve, he placed an iron bar against the hub cover and began to hammer away, despite my warning that he'd break the mechanism. After a lot of pounding, out came the hub, the cover smashed to bits and the crank sleeve broken. Now you've done it, I cried in dismay. Can you repair the damage? In the most nonchalant manner, he answered, no, nor can anyone in all of France. That's what you get for having an American wheel. I'm just going to interrupt him there. This caused me quite a bit of confusion when reading the book. But when he talks about his wheel, he's not just referring to his, well, wheel, but his entire bike. I'll let him continue the story. Then you must pay for the damage you've caused. He only stuck out his lower lip, looked foolish and smiled along, surprised, no. Leaving the wheel with the mechanic, I went to see the police. They directed me to the justice of the peace, he to an Englishman, the latter to the prefect. The prefect sent me back to the police, and so it went until I again stood before the justice of the peace. As nothing could be done until after eight days, I gave up the idea of prosecuting. I returned to the shop of the mechanic. That individual seemed to have grown more solicitous for my welfare. He promised to keep my wheel until the broken parts could arrive from America and then ship the repaired wheel wherever I would direct. As he was under obligation to me, this appeared to be the best plan to follow. It's not the only time he has recourse to the law to sort out his problems. He is, after all, a lawyer, but I think he's often disappointed with the European shrug of indifference that he often receives in return. The story of his bike continues once he's in the Pyrenean town of Po. While visiting Lourdes, as all good Catholics do, Max meets a wealthy brewer from Indiana who, although his financial and physical health have been somewhat, in his words, shattered by two financial crises, takes Max under his wing and provides him with some money to buy a new bicycle. As with all the other encounters he has with people on his European adventure, Max only uses the initials of the people that he meets. I suppose that way he doesn't have to resort to doing what I needed to do with Manfred and rename him Helmut. Ten days after our arrival in Poe, word came from my former employer in Bordeaux 
who had had my bicycle shipped from Poitiers, as he didn't trust the mechanic there. But the bicycle parts from the United States had arrived. I was overjoyed. At last, my long wait was to end. Next morning's mail completely changed matters. Two small pieces had arrived at the shop of the mechanic in Poitiers, but the three essential parts, according to this man, were not in the package. I believe to this day that the mechanic kept those three parts to revenge himself upon me. The forwarding company had the package registered, and it would be queer indeed that two pieces should arrive and the necessary three be lost. When Mr. B saw the letter, he had once advised me to go ahead and buy another wheel. That afternoon, as we were sitting in the park, enjoying the delightful air, he handed me one hundred dollars. I took the money with the determination not to use it, except in case of absolute necessity. I was resolved to make the trip on the sum with which I'd begun. Two days later, mounted on an Alcyon, which cost fifty-five dollars, I set out for Biarritz and Spain. Well, I suppose it helps if you get friendly with wealthy brewers from Indiana. Let's take a few moments to think about the kind of bikes that he was using and how they compare to what you might invest in to complete a similar trip nowadays. The writer Michael Hutchinson is the author of a book called Recyclists, 200 Years on Two Wheels. I asked him what the 1908 Alcyon might have been like. They were steel, um, steel frames, steel wheels, often equipped with something like a Sturmey Archer three-speed hub. Those were very prevalent at that point and pretty much unaltered to the to the present day. The bit of brakes, which probably didn't work very well, a set of fairly flat, maybe slightly dropped handlebars, leather saddle. I mean, in a lot of respects, bikes from that era, they're not all that different from the sort of roadsters that people were riding in the sort of the 1970s and 1980s. Or if you think about a, a slightly more dynamic version of a, of, a, of a classic Dutch upright bike, that's the kind of technology we're talking about. And, and to me, what the most interesting thing about it is actually how little the, the technology has changed. A bit more weight, a little bit more flexible. The brakes would work a lot less better. It's probably if you jumped onto one of them right now, the thing you would probably notice first was your relative inability to stop. And if somebody gave you one of these bikes and said, right, OK, Michael, you're off on a 16,300 mile tour of Europe, would you be looking forward to it or would you be kind of recoiling in horror? Fine with me. Um, no, I mean, bikes in that era are, I mean, they're, they're good. They are really very good. They're surprisingly good. Generally, they're made of steel, which is actually very comfortable. If you want to go for a long distance tour, steel is a great, a great substance to make a bike out of. The gear ratios are a little narrow. The brakes, as I say, are a little bit ineffective, but it would be a perfectly, perfectly pleasant way to spend a few weeks riding across Europe on a bike like that. I don't have no problem with that at all. Were the bikes at that time quite reliable? Yeah, they were probably not as reliable as a modern bike. There were, you know, features like the cranks would have been attached using things like cotter pins, which were never terribly reliable at the best of times, but they, they weren't bad. Um, I mean, the bike at that point was, oh, even sort of safety bikes at that point were sort of 20 years old. Um, they'd been around for a while. So, and they were a, kind of a consumer product. They were very heavily marketed. The, the market was very competitive. So that tended to drive up reliability because reliability was one of the first things that people wanted. If they wanted to go cycling touring, they wanted a bike that wasn't going to fall apart. So in general, they weren't at all bad. And cycle tourism in Europe in the early 20th century, was it something that had really taken off yet? Yeah, I mean, in the early 20th century, cycle touring was was huge in the in Europe, in the UK and, and in northwestern Europe in general. And there were people undertaking kind of long, long tours from the sort of 1890s onwards. In the 1890s, there's a whole raft of books published in the UK by aristocrats who had done the sort of the Black Forest by bicycle and this sort of thing. And these are self Sort of effectively privately published books about their tours. If you told someone in the early 20th century or you were a cyclist, the image they would immediately have had in their head would have been somebody in their tweed plus, flo- plus fours and tweed jacket heading off on, a, on an expedition, heading off to, to explore somewhere different, somewhere new. So it was, it was very much what cycling was for. 
if he'd done it in 1898, he would definitely have been an aristocrat or upwardly mobile kind of a guy. But 1908, it changed a bit because of the the invention of the motor car. The kind of the, the aristocrat started doing the same thing by motor car around about the same era. It's very much an era when cycling was was in flux. If you go and read things like H.G. Wells's The Wheels of Chance, that was featuring a draper who was off on a, on a cycle tour and fancying he might be mistaken for an earl because he was on a bicycle. Um, and that, I think, was published in 1898. And if it had been sort of two years later, he could have written a, bike, a book about an earl on a bicycle tour and being mistaken for a draper. It was a very abrupt switch. So Maximilian wouldn't have been seen as any kind of oddity or curiosity as he was cycling around Europe? Uh, the sheer distance would have set him out somewhat, um, and the kind of the amount of luggage you'd be carrying on a bike for that kind of trip would have made you, uh, you know, an admirable figure. You know, he would have been more regarded like a like a the way we'd look at a, a racer these days as someone who was kind of quite heroic. He wouldn't have been regarded as weird or or strange or doing something very peculiar. If he'd set off to do the same thing in 1965, he'd probably have been regarded as rather odder than he would have been perceived as being in 1908. The amount of kit he actually takes with him is astonishingly small illicit in the book, and it's more of a bike packing setup. Bike packing is is not very far off the way they'd be the way they'd be approaching it. I mean, you also have to bear in mind that with relatively limited gear ratios, if you packed heavy, you were going to be a very long time getting up any hills that were going. It's not like a modern touring bike that will have um, 20 gears. So at that point, you can at one end, you can have a more or less one to one gear ratio. You, you can't do that with a Sturmey Archer three speed hub. So if you carry a lot of weight, you are going to go uphill very, very slowly. And you're also going to go downhill very, very fast, which with dodgy brakes, you don't want to be carrying 20 kilos of luggage down an alp if you can avoid it. Thanks to Michael for his insights into bicycles and cycle touring at the end of the 19th and early 20th centuries. That point he makes about the image of a typical cycle tourist being dressed in tweed is, of course, how the newspaper artist chose to depict Maximilian beside the article about his wedding to Ape Lucia. It wasn't an accurate representation of the man himself, but was clearly how others imagined him to be. Returning to the subject of money, we've already heard Max describe his method of minimising expenditure by rocking up at an unsuspecting person's house and pleading his case politely. We'll hear an example of that in a few moments, but it's worth reflecting upon how much 50 cents, that's what he claims to have spent on average each day, in 1908 is worth today. According to detailed research, OK, I just Googled it, 50 cents in 1908 is the equivalent of about $14 in 2020. That's £11, or about €12.50. In 1957, the American travel writer Arthur Fromer wrote a famous travel guide called Europe on $5 a day. That would have been quite a lavish trip by Max's standards, as 50 cents in 1908 was worth only $1.50, by 1957. Fromer kept updating his book every few years and in 1975 published Europe on $10 a day, by which point Max's 50 cents had grown to $3. Fromer's last book in the series was published in 2007, by which time the title had become Europe on $95 a day. The chances of you surviving on just $14 a day in 2020 are, I would have thought pretty slim. But if you want to have a go, here's Max's technique in action as described by the man himself. He's in Norway, heading in the direction of Stockholm, quite close to the Swedish border, and feeling a bit peckish. By noon of the following day, near Fliesen, between Vand and Kongsvinger, I came to a fine residence, set back from the road, surrounded by gardens. In answer to my ring, the door was opened by a handsome young woman, the mistress of the house. She greeted me with a smile. My courage returned. Good day, madam, I said. Do you speak German? Oh, yes, very well, she replied. Uh, madam, I went on, I am a young American student whose purse is not any too full. Perhaps you could give me something to eat. Was she going to refuse me, or would she tell me to wait while she warmed up something? No, she smiled at me 
Will you come in? I followed her to a richly furnished drawing room. What next? Do you just want lunch, or will you take dinner with us? Our dinner is at three. Could it be possible that my ears were not deceiving me? I ventured a reply. Uh, if it will not inconvenience you too much, I would rather take a little lunch, as I want to be on the road as soon as possible. Very well. Will you come into the smoking room? Uh, there it is more comfortable. Uh, pardon me for a minute, she added, when I was seated in the smoking room, while I order you lunch. She left the room. I pinched myself. I struck the chair on which I was sitting. This handsome woman, the richly furnished room, these fine chairs, were they a reality? The lady soon returned. She told me that she was alone that her husband was out hunting. Having probably interpreted my glance toward the piano, she asked me to play, which I did until lunch was ready. During the meal, she sat opposite and encouraged me to eat. A most enjoyable meal it was, with wild mountain berries and cream and the most delicious chocolate. I felt ashamed of the number of cupfuls I drank. When bidding her goodbye, she asked me to pardon her for not being able to place before me a better meal. Incomprehensible hospitality, and yet typical of the people of the country. Never did I ask for a drink of water, but that I was given milk. And it would not be one glassful, but a pitcher full. Milk being lacking, other refreshments were offered with the utmost friendliness. Much of Travelling Light is objective, descriptive travel writing, but Max clearly enjoys a bit of people watching as well. It's not a great tactic to make broad generalisations about an entire nation based upon a relatively small number of encounters with the population, but let's be honest, we all do it when we travel to a different country. We often do it when we travel to a different part of our own country. I would, however, argue that as cycle tourists we have more evidence upon which to base our generalisations and, as we heard him explain earlier, Max had specifically chosen to travel by bicycle to experience things in a way that would have been impossible via any other method of transport. It's a theme that he picks upon again in the final few pages of the book. This trip to me was invaluable. I became intimately acquainted with the different countries of Europe and the manners and habits of the people. No train spirited me from one town to another. I observed every foot of the road. Every mile impressed itself upon my mind. Unlike other tourists, I didn't lodge at hotels. Hotel life is the same throughout the world. I lived with the people of the different lands through which I passed. I observed their houses, ate their fare, entered into their amusements and heard their stories direct from themselves. And as an example of his people watching, here he is back in Rome talking about the different kinds of tourists he's meeting. In the Forum Romanum one day, I met a German professor. You can never mistake a German professor, and once you meet him, you can never forget him. A German is the most precise and methodical of all tourists. We spent a full hour and a half at the Arch of Constantine. The professor did not gaze an hour and a half at the Arch. No, he read from a pamphlet, every now and then glancing at the Arch to confirm his reading and check it off. He then walked three times slowly around it to be sure that nothing had escaped him. Then he told me to the next ruin. The French tourist skims over rapidly and superficially, yet he's more brilliantly reminiscent than the German. The English, and especially the American tourist, does a sight. He gives five minutes to this, two minutes to that. He must be in Florence today and in Rome tomorrow. He takes his vacation as seriously and as hurriedly as his business. It's after making these observations that Max goes off to have his audience with the Pope. 
as reported, much to my gratitude, by the Kerrville Mountain Sun in Texas some 26 years later, as it allowed me to state definitively that he was travelling in 1908 and 1909. Travelling light or cycling Europe on 50 cents a day is a thoroughly charming read, especially for those of us who have also attempted long-distance cycles within Europe. It's clearly a different world in 1908 to that of today, but if you have the time, the inclination and, let's be honest, a bit of money to finance such a trip over 16 months, you'd probably be able to manage just fine. And lots of people over the decades have indeed embarked upon similar European cycling expeditions. I managed to locate two of them. In 2010, Lahel Benedek and Elod Kerazigi set off from their home in the centre of Romania on a 15-month cycling tour of Europe. Elod now lives in Norway, running a bicycle shop, and Lahel is in Hungary bringing up his young children, as you will hear on the recording. I started by asking Elod what had been the motivation for them to embark on such an epic cycling journey. All the time you want to try something new, to try something different. And when you are doing the same things over and over again, every day, going to work, home, sleep, you want to get out from your comfort zone, do something else. And then in uh, 2009, it, a Spanish guy called Santiago cycled from uh, Austria. Uh, going to Egypt and we had the chance to meet him and then he gave the idea that yes this could be a perfect opportunity to me to do the same trip or a similar one so basically at the beginning it was just an idea we I did not have any idea how it's gonna go it was not planned for this long it was just an idea and then we sit down with Lehel drinking some few beers and then uh, okay why not do it big even bigger let's do whole europe and then it was like okay which country we should go first and then uh, yeah take it all all what we can do it was 36000 kilometers if i'm correct it was 15 months in total we were 15 months on the road so first we went to, to the west until uh, Switzerland and uh, from there we came back through Germany and Slovakia and then we went um, up to Poland to the Baltic states. From there we took a boat to Finland and uh, we went up to the top, up to North Cape and from North Cape we came down all the way through Norway and then Denmark, and the Benelux states, uh, France, and um, the UK, Ireland, again UK, France, uh, Spain, Portugal, uh, Spain, Italy, Albania, and then, yes, Hungary, Slovakia, and Romania. And this was 15 months long. It was a low budget trip. It mean it meant that uh, we had three euro uh, for per day for for everything. So we did not have a big budget. So we had one thousand three hundred uh, euros per person, and that's it. No more. So we were using all the time the tent, couch surfing, and occasionally we were also using warm showers. Yes, and in our way, we received also a lot of help from the people uh, who do we have uh, met. Uh, for example, they helped us with a hot meal, or sometimes uh, during, especially during winter time, we were in uh, Norway, so uh, they were really friendly and welcoming, and they uh, received in their homes and then um, they uh, invited for a dinner and sometimes they, they even made for us sandwiches and uh, for the next day or sometimes they had a van and uh, when it was so cold then they uh, took us uh, 100 kilometer with their van so yeah we received a lot of help so i think this was the key for this low budget we have been robbed in uh, portugal close to border to Spain, I get beaten up 
but uh, thinking now back it was an experience but it was also a lesson so i don't think now back like it it was really bad and nice things like every country was bringing something new or the food or the person what you met or just the landscape every day was a new experience for us i think the whole uh, trip was a life changing uh, experience europe is really colorful there are so many culture and so many uh, different kind of people it was so good to have this experience to see the irish people how friendly they can be or the norwegian people how uh, open minded are don't be afraid to take the risk to leave your comfort zone you will gain much more after a trip like this you will know so it's just do it be careful watch where you got drop your tent watch the people what you're going to meet because there are traps here outside so but with time you will learn and you will uh, evolve just go ahead do it don't be afraid from my side i, I don't know I, it's really difficult to give advice i think each trip is different each uh, person who would like to have a, a similar trip uh, things different so it can be fun but uh, just just do it yes it's, if you feel the the instinct to have a similar trip then do it 3 euros per day 1300 euros per person i stand corrected to what i said earlier it clearly is possible to complete such a trip on a tiny budget in terms of hospitality to strangers it seems that europe remains just as open and generous as it was back in 1908 and 1909 so as they both said towards the end of our conversation just do it which brings us nicely back to maximilian in the final two paragraphs of his book Max addresses his readers directly and attempts to encourage us to embark upon our own epic cycle tour of Europe. He even suggests a more manageable way of completing the feat if we don't have a spare 16 months available to us. Such a trip is not so remarkable that anyone cannot make it. To stretch it out for 16 months over all of Europe on $250, however, one must be able to speak at least six of the principal languages and have a large amount of patience, perseverance, and endurance. Patience above all. But this trip could be divided into periods of three months. One trip could take up the British Isles, another Belgium, Holland, and northern France, a third Scandinavia, a fourth Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, a fifth France and Spain, a sixth Italy. Anyone during the vacation months could take one of these six trips mentioned. It can be done cheaply, and it is the only way of really seeing Europe. It's the only way of really seeing Europe. Those are the final words of the book. Well, before he embarks upon his epic appendix, listing all the places that he visited. I agree wholeheartedly. It is the only way of really seeing Europe. That said, I have no wish whatsoever to follow Maximilian's route. I'll happily leave that to someone else. What I do find appealing, however, is how Max manages to visit what he considers to be every capital of Europe, with the exception of Lisbon and Petrograd. As I've already noted, I don't think it was ever his intention to visit every capital city, but we'll never know definitively. We've also got to bear in mind the political geography of the continent in 1908, as set out by James Stout earlier in the podcast. There were far fewer independent countries than there are now. In 1908, Max cycled through the following modern-day capitals, London, Brussels, Amsterdam, Copenhagen, Oslo, which was Christiania at the time, Stockholm, Berlin, Prague, Vienna, Vaduz in Liechtenstein, Bern, Luxembourg and Paris. It wasn't until 1917 that Finland gained its independence from the Russian Empire, which also included Poland and all of the Baltic states. Petrograd, modern-day St. Petersburg, was the capital of Russia, and that's one of the two capitals he didn't visit. Although Max visited Prague, for him it wouldn't have been a capital city, as it was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, 
with its capital in Vienna. In 1909, Max cycled through Madrid, Rome, the Vatican City, San Marino, Ljubljana, Budapest and Dublin. We know that he didn't go as far as Lisbon and again, at the time both Ljubljana and Budapest were cities of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and not capitals. Similarly, Dublin would have been a city of the United Kingdom, not the capital of a free Irish state. So by my reckoning, he visited 16 capital cities that were capital cities in 1908 and 1909. He visited 20 that we now consider to be capital cities. But what about Romania, Bulgaria, Serbia, Montenegro, the Ottoman Empire, which included modern-day Albania, and of course Greece? When he writes, with the exception of Lisbon and Petrograd, I visited every capital of Europe, he's been a little economical with the truth. But again, as we heard from James earlier, that's probably how Europe was perceived at the time by most people, everything to the north and west of the Danube. My definition of Europe is a little more accurate and stops at the borders with Russia and Turkey. That said, I dare say some will disagree, especially fans of Eurovision, but that aside, I think there are now 45 independent countries in Europe, including the Vatican City. That's 45 capital cities. I may have cycled three times across Europe myself and covered about 16,000 kilometres in the process, but I've only cycled through 21 of those countries and 10 capital cities. I've visited another eight capitals, but not on a bike. That leaves a lot of countries and a lot of capitals that I've never visited. Yet I claim to be Mr Cycling Europe. Cycling to all those 45 capitals would be a challenging but rewarding experience. And like Max suggests, you wouldn't necessarily need to do them all in one trip. Irrespective, embarking upon such a journey would be difficult in the Europe of 2020, with the coronavirus restrictions still in force across the continent, some of which might stretch into 2021. But you could perhaps make a start in your home country. Max finished his epic journey by cycling around my home country, the United Kingdom, and Ireland. He was quite taken by England. This might make you smile. It was a relief to get into the delightful country leading to Chester. Interest in the English landscape can never flag. England is a gem. Too small to be monotonous, objects crowd upon each other, the panorama continually changing. Here is an old castle. There above the treetops are visible the spires of some cathedral. Now you pass an ivy or rose-covered cottage. Again, you ride beneath an arcade of giant elms or oaks or sycamores, and always on the best of highways. It is a paradise for cyclists. It's a paradise for cyclists. Mm, perhaps it's time to test out if that's still the case in 2020. A trip around the capitals of the United Kingdom and Ireland in 2020? Hmm, there's an idea. Maximilian died in 1959 and Ape Lucia in 1976. I couldn't find an obituary for either Ape or Maximilian, but I did find Maximilian's death notice in the Chicago Tribune. There's no evidence that he used the Italian title he married into during his life, but in death, at least, he was elevated to his aristocratic pedestal. St George, Count Maximilian J. St George von Juracek, of 1202 Chestnut Avenue, Wilmot, husband of Countess Lucia St. George, father of Mrs. Arthur Baker of New York City, Mrs. Giorgio Ottaviani of Milan, Italy, and George Quiricomani St. George of Wilmot, six grandchildren, member of Holy Name Society, Knights of Columbus, Lafayette Council, Catholic Lawyers Guild, Advocate Society, Illinois Bar Association, Notre Dame Law Association, please omit flowers. No mention of cycling. Perhaps this podcast, however, has helped elevate him to the position that he deserves in the pantheon of early 20th century long-distance cycling pioneers. To me, Max, you are royalty when it comes to European cycling and the original Mr Cycling Europe. You can find out more about Maximilian J. St. George at cyclingeurope.org forward slash max. Many thanks to everyone who's assisted in the making of this podcast. Dr. James Stout in San Diego, Michael Hutchinson, 
Elod and Lahel in Norway and Hungary respectively, Klaus Blans in Stuttgart, who played the role of Manfred or Helmut, and the reader who gave a voice to Max himself, Jeremy Walker. The Cycling Europe podcast will return soon. If you think you have an interesting cycling story to tell, please get in touch via the website cyclingeurope.org, via social media at Cycling Europe, or by emailing podcast at cyclingeurope.org. Thank you for listening, stay safe and goodbye.